This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Renowned Louisiana chef John Foles on this edition of Conversations. Chef John Foles has helped take the taste of Louisiana cuisine globally. So much so that the Louisiana legislature deemed him Louisiana's culinary ambassador to the world. From Japan to Moscow to a Vatican State dinner in Rome, Chef Foles' recipes have pleased the palates of many. To say he is just a great chef would be unfair. Foles has used his skills to build an impressive array of businesses. From his signature launching pad restaurant, Lafitte's Landing, he has created a business empire that encompasses catering, publishing, food manufacturing, and broadcasting. His nationally syndicated cooking show entitled A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles and Company is a favorite for many right here on PBS. We welcome John Foltz to Conversations. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Jeff, very nice to be here with you. Thanks so much. It's our pleasure. Describe the taste of Louisiana. <laughs> well, uh, uh, to adequately describe the taste of Louisiana, I think we need to go back about 300 to 350 <laughs> years with the founding of Louisiana. But, uh, uh, but the taste of Louisiana, my television show, is... Uh, uh, First and foremost, uh, uh, was uh, originated back in 1989, and the, and the premise of the show was basically to mimic life in Louisiana, and that is taking us through the seven nations that created Cajun and Creole cuisine and culture. When we think of the French and the Spanish and the French and the Germans, the Italians, the Africans, the English, all who arrived in Louisiana at some point and brought with them their cuisine, their technique, their philosophies in cooking, and also their ingredients to, to create new dishes through intermarriage in Louisiana, uh, created not only the taste of Louisiana as we know it as a television series, but a taste of Louisiana actually built out of the mud and bayous of the swamplands of South Louisiana. So it's, it's been an honor and a privilege over the years to not only write about the subject, but to, to broadcast the subject worldwide and to take my culinary uh, cuisine globally as well. It's all a taste of Louisiana. That's neat. What kind of response do you get when you go internationally? I know, for example, you were in Moscow back in the 80s during the Reagan-Gorbachev summit. Right. Tell me about that experience. Well, you know, I think one of the things that 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 really makes us as chefs or, or culinarians uh, excited about our work every day, and I do consider our work a gift. I mean, I think it's been a great gift that all of us as creative uh, chefs have been given and uh, given to share uh, with the world, so to speak. And uh, and I think to see the faces of people tasting for the first time a cuisine or an ingredient they've never seen or tasted before, a flavor that's hitting their taste buds that's uh, like, wow, what is that? And it's a gumbo, you know, and yeah. what is a gumbo? Well, to, to explain a gumbo, you know, you have to go back to the, to, the, to, the, to the okra of the slaves and the filet of the Native Americans and the dark brown roux of the French. How do you explain it? You explain it through taste. So when you put that spoon on somebody's, uh, in somebody's mouth and they take it in and they say, oh my God, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> that's how you explain, uh, that's how you explain the taste of our, of our food. It's uh, but, but it's all about the, 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 the people eating it, the experience that we see on their faces when they taste it, that inspire us to continue to cook on and continue to do the things that we do. And, uh, and again, that's our taste of Louisiana. Do you get a different reaction in the United States versus say in Moscow or Beijing or Tokyo? Well, you know, we're fortunate in Louisiana that our uh, our culture, our Creole culture, our Cajun culture, and certainly the foods, and certainly Nouvelle Orléans, you know, New Orleans, uh, being one of the first cities founded after St. Augustine, so to speak, uh, in the New World, people know us even if they don't really know us. You right. know, they know that New Orleans is Mardi Gras. Yeah. They know that New Orleans is bayous and mystical swamp lions, and they know <laughs> that there's exotic foods and alligators. And, <laughs> and, and, and I think there's an intrigue just in the fact that, it's like me, I knew Moscow before I went, mm -hmm. just because I, I knew the image of the Kremlin and all. Right, right. I had never been there, but I, I, I was enthralled to see it. And I think that's kind of the precursor to everything we do. People expect that what they have heard or envisioned in their own mind about what they're going to experience when they taste Louisiana 
it's going to be uh, uh, it's going to be uh, 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 fun, just a learning experience. So I, I would say that uh, people around the globe are just as excited to taste our food as people coming to my restaurant in New Orleans and sitting at a table and saying, I, I don't know what I'm eating, but I know it's good. I think it's the same whether it's here or, or there. There's an expectation that we have to meet. Speaking of your restaurant in New Orleans, relatively new, tell me about it. Well, Restaurant Revolution, you, you, you so generously mentioned my Lafitte's Landing being the beginning of my, my company. And Lafitte's Landing was my first restaurant built in a home that was uh, was a gift on, at the marriage uh, to the pirate Jean Lafitte uh, and his wife uh, Emma Viala, who was uh, from the Viala plantation family, and that was the home that my Lafitte's Landing was built uh, in or out of in the, uh, in Donaldsonville, Louisiana, uh, and right at the Sunshine Bridge, and. Uh, I operated that restaurant for over 25 years, and a, and a devastating fire took the plantation in 1998, and then I moved into my bittersweet plantation in Donaldsonville, my home, uh, to open my new restaurant and bed and breakfast. And that operated for a while, but then I turned it into a full-time B&B and, and kitchen. But I was very fortunate in June of, uh, of uh, 2012 this year to uh, open my restaurant revolution in New Orleans. Uh, with my partner Rick Tremonto, the very famous chef from Chicago, who's who everybody knows his name. If you're into into Food Network or cooking or PBS or whatever, you know the name um, uh, Rick Tremonto. And he and I built Restaurant Revolution at the Royal Sinesta Hotel on Bourbon and Bienville in New Orleans. And it is about showcasing the iconic foods and the historic foods that make New Orleans and Louisiana famous, but yet looking at them in a contemporary way. So it's uh, it's really taken off. And we're 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 enjoying a lot of uh, of great fun cooking together, and uh, and it's an experience. I have two chefs from two different walks of life. He's yeah. from New York. I'm from the swamps of Louisiana. Combining our culinary talents to create something that's revolutionary. We hope <laughs> so. Uh, so it's uh, it's a great place for us to be right now in cooking. Just another addition to, to to the companies that we run. When the two of you get together, tell me what it might be like. How, how might the day go? if you're going to create something. Well, you know, one of the, the mysteries of two is it's uncommon for two chefs to come together because both of you have two, have two creative spirits and you're coming from different thought processes in the way you view food. And that's what makes uh, restaurants different. You go to a restaurant because the chefs think differently about food. So you're going to go eat his and you go eat hers and you have a different experience with your, your friends and family. Well, Rick and I sat down to talk one day and, and there was a bottle of Opus One on the table. The, the great wine from Mandava and Rothschild, the collaboration of the, those two great winemakers, one from France and one from Napa Valley. They were both giants in the industry. They were both, they owned the industry in their own country. But yet they decided to collaborate and come together in a wine. And they built Opus One. And the label, I was looking at it, and it was the, the head of Mandava and the head of Rothschild. And they were looking in opposite directions, but the back of their heads were joined. And I thought to myself, that's exactly what we're doing. It's not about exchanging our thoughts with each other. It's backing our brains up to each other, still looking in the direction that we love, in the directions that we grew up in. But yet, there's a meeting point in the back of our brains that says, you know, it's only food. Yeah. It's only great service. It's only raw ingredients. And collectively, our brains put together can create something new and exciting, something revolutionary, so yeah. to speak. And that's how the restaurant came together. So when we create, it's, uh, it's about taste, it's about flavor, and we each look at food in a different way. So it's interesting that I can look at a plate of eggs and ham, and he can look at a plate of eggs and ham, and we see it totally different. Yeah. We see the flavors totally different. We, I might want to put a little bit of uh, hot sauce or Creole seasoning on it. He may want to put some type of a, a flavored hollandaise sauce on top yeah. of it, but at the end of the day, you can, you can bet, you can rest assured, it's going to be a special plate of food at the end. So it's a great collaboration. I'm enjoying it a lot, and uh, it's also maintaining your own identity. So. Yeah. Very, very nice restaurant revolution. We're very excited about it. Uh, that's that's neat. What might we find there as far as a, a, a particular dish? Uh, well, uh, uh, a, a good example is our uh, 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 corn and crab cappuccino. It's uh, it's it's a corn and crab soup that's so southern, but we serve it with a lot of pomp and circumstance and in these beautiful Versace 
cups and uh, and floating on top of it is the whipped cream made with corn, the, the milk of the corn cob that's that with, that's just bursting with the, the excitement of corn flavor. There's a shave truffle right on top of it. But more importantly, around the side of the plate are the elements that remind us of where that soup came from. It, it's a gift from Mesoamerica. It's a, it's a gift of the Native American cultures of the South. So there's a piece of corn shuck and there's the corn silk on the thing. There's popcorn as the garnish, the crouton in the soup is a little bit popcorn. So when you put your spoon into it, it's all of these wonderful magical flavors of the corn and crab soup but instantly you're reminded that it's built up on this altar of Versace and, uh, and these magnificent uh, elements that say, wow, I never thought that this was a gift of a simple Native American tribe that, that gave us corn and shared that with us and built an addition to our culinary culture. And each dish is like that, whether it's our turtle soup that comes from the Louisiana loggerhead snapping turtle and Rick and I have taken an 1820s recipe that we found and and played with that recipe and used the chow chow relishes of the uh, Germans that came to Louisiana and and the turtle of the Cajun trappers and and those elements come together in this beautiful soup uh, and, and it's all about the cultures and their wonderful wonderful creative talents once they intermarried and brought a little bit of each of their worlds into one pot and that's what we're doing and uh, so you're going to see uh, things like that throughout the menu but constantly reminding our diner that it was Africans who did that plate it was Indians who gave us that gift it was Germans who gave us that smoked smoked meat and ondu and tasso and and over here it was the English who gave us this wonderful creams and butters and uh, it's it's an interesting place to create we create differently there than any other restaurant I've ever been in it's fascinating do you personally have a favorite ingredient? Is there a particular ingredient you go, this, this is my signature thing that I can make work? Garlic. Garlic. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> but, you know, garlic is, is uh, uh, I love garlic. Garlic is the oldest spice known to man. Uh, garlic had a major place in the Bible when the Israelites came down uh, in, in the desert and Moses came down the, uh, the mount with the tablets in his hand and found Aaron and, and his group uh, 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 worshiping an idol, a, a golden calf that they had melted after they had come out of uh, 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 Egypt in slavery. And, and he broke the tablets, of course, on the ground because he was so furious. And they looked up at him and he said, you made us leave Egypt without even taking our garlic with us. It was such an important part. The Ten Commandments were broken over, <laughs> over thought that garlic was left. <laughs> but, but garlic is sweet if you roast it on a, on a barbecue pit. You spread it on bread like butter. If you put the pungent ingredient in a, in a soup, it has this aromatic that you can get uh, nowhere else. It's a medicinal herb. It's good for the blood. It's a, it has historical significance. Every culture in the world uses it. It's the only, only herb that ever everybody uses in cooking and we cannot cook anything in Louisiana I even say bread pudding without uh, <laughs> without having garlic in it <laughs> garlic is definitely my favorite ingredient yeah. do you have a favorite food you know I like simplicity in cooking actually I mean you, people think chefs are just all wild wild about food and we are I mean we wild about the creation of food the creation of elements of food but but at the end of the day you know it's the foods of your youth that you really thrive and crave day in and day out. You know, our palates are set very early at the home, at the hands of our mothers, in the hands of our, uh, at, at, in the kitchen of our homes. When we're young children, your children, what they eat is influenced by what they, those first meals and in, in, in once they start to eat solid foods. And they're influenced heavily by their parents. If if you hate green beans, I'll rest assured your daughter's going to hate green beans because we pass that DNA on to them verbally or actually. In the, so I love the simplicity of the thought of the braised dishes of the swamplands of Louisiana, the simple meat dishes that are stewed long and slow in these wonderful broths and onions and celery, the trinity, uh, the, all of these great flavors and sopped up with French bread. These are the comfort foods of my youth and, and I love them, love them very much. And somebody asked me one day, if it's your last meal, what, what's it gonna be? And I guess everybody's asked that question. I said, 
I don't even have to think about it. It's a bowl of this swarthy, dark brown roux chicken and sausage gumbo that my grandmother used to make with a scoop of German potato salad right on the rim of the bowl. And I'll eat that bowl and I'm ready for my maker. I can, I'm, I'm done. It's my last meal. It's the first thing I remember. It's what I want. <laughs> what was it like for a young John Pulse growing up in Louisiana? My father was a trapper. and. Um, and uh, our Christmas was February 25th. It was called Trapper's Christmas. We didn't have December 25th. Papa Noel appeared on the swamp, in the swamplands of Louisiana in his sleigh on uh, February 25th when the trappers came out of the swamps and they sold their furs to the Jewish fur traders who had come from Alsace-Lorraine early on. They were, and the Cajuns and the Alsatian Jews were close friends. They depended on each other and, uh, and they trusted each other in the swamps. And, and my dad would disappear from home in November and he'd come back in February just like, uh, uh, just like the Corita Bois, the runners of the woods of Quebec back in the 1600s with his pelts and his alligator skins. And I remember rolling them out on the front porch of our Cajun cabin. I mean, it's vivid in my mind. And uh, it was so simple a life. Uh, it, it was so unbelievably different from what I'm doing today. Uh, I mean, I couldn't even imagine a world two miles away from that front porch of my car. It didn't exist. Mm. And everything that I was expected to do in my entire life was right there on that landscape because there was no need to do anything else. Anything you could want in life was right there as far as my ancestors felt. And um, it was a great place to grow up, a humble place to grow up, but yet a loving place to grow up. And we had nothing, but we didn't know any better. And we knew that everything we needed to eat, clothe ourselves with, shelter ourselves with, was right there for us. Even the medicines were there. I mean, the berries of the swamps and the uh, the, the poultices that they put on, on, on your chest. I mean, it was all simple things. It was all herbal medicines or whatever it was. But you know what? It's who I am today. It's what I, I thrive about today, the simplicity of life, the stories that we tell, what inspires me to know that anybody can make it. The, the, the things that I go into my classroom at Nickel State University where I have over 400 students studying culinary in a four-year degree program and I walk into that freshman class every year and I say, don't ever tell me what you can't do. Don't ever tell me it's somebody else's responsibility. Don't ever tell me that you're not able. You're looking at somebody whose life was the mud floor of the swamps and I have brought food to 12 countries of the world. I fed popes, five presidents. Uh, not because I was given any uh, wherewithal to do it, but because the desire was there and I put no boundaries in front of me. I just did it because I wanted to. And that's really what that life was all about for me. And that, that for everybody who grew up in that environment, you knew your life depended on your ability and the people around you to make it happen. And uh, that's, who, that's who I am. And I, and I cherish that thought every single day that it's as simple as that. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. You've been very successful in the business world. Tell me the story how you went from chef to businessman. Necessity. Um, I didn't know when I took that step from, from cook to entrepreneur. I really don't. I just knew one day that if I didn't look outside of my front door and find out why I didn't have as many people sitting in my tables as I needed to pay my bills, I need to go out and find the rest of the seats to put in the chairs. So um, it dawned on me that I needed to market our uniqueness. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew that there was something special going on in that area of the country where I opened Lafitte's Landing. I knew we were on the banks of the Mississippi River. I knew we were on the foothills of the swamp lands. I knew that language was different. I knew people spoke French in many of our areas. I knew our ingredients were everything from raccoon to muskrat to alligator tail, as well as sauce pecans and creoles. Even our foods names were different. And I said, my God, this is fabulous stuff. Mm. Why shouldn't the world know about this? And one day I saw a bus, a tour bus pass in front of my place that I had never seen before. And on the back was a sign that said New Orleans Tours and the phone number. And I said, I wonder who's on that bus. I said, those people need to hear this story right there. And I chased that bus down. I, it went to a plantation home and I walked onto that bus after everybody got off and the driver was sitting collecting his notes. And I said, 
where, where are you all from? And he said, well, we're from New Orleans. We pick up these people at hotels. I said, where are they from? He said, all over the world. I said, well, how do I get them to stop at my place across the river and hear this story and eat the foods that are really of this area? This is the foods of the swamp floor that I'm serving. The swamp floor pantry gives me everything I need to cook. You, you're just eating like chicken salad sandwiches here. Yeah. Uh, for the same price, I'll feed you over there the history of Louisiana. Yeah. And he said, wow, he said, can I get a buck a head? <laughs> <laughs> I said, ah, business. <laughs> I said, you can get a buck a head if I can get that whole buck. <laughs> I figured it out right away. I said, this is entrepreneurship. Yeah. He, he makes it, I make it, they make it, and they get the greatest store, the greatest food. I build a business. And eventually, I had about 11 buses there, and it taught me that if, as long as I marketed our uniqueness and told the story of a people that was so unique in the world and the foods that were so different from anything else, and even New Orleans, 70 miles away, could not compete with the swamp floors of Louisiana, I knew we had a story to tell, and that's the story I've taken to 12 countries of the world. <laughs> that's what I fed Gorbachev, and that's what I, <laughs> and that's what I fed Pope John Paul. And uh, it's a very, very incredible thing. I fed a saint the foods of the swamp floor of Louisiana, or a saint to be, I guess. <laughs> it's great. a good, it's a good story. Yeah. Talk about some of your businesses. Obviously, you have the restaurant in New Orleans. You have um, the television and radio shows, um, but you also are, are above and beyond that. I know you're in the manufacturing, food right, manufacturing right, right. business. What what, what exactly is that? Well, my food manufacturing division was, again, uh, not some great, and, and, I, and I tell people this all the time, especially my young students, I said, you know, it's never, I wish I could say I was smart enough to have built a company. I'm certainly not smart enough to have built a company. I mean, I was smart enough to see a need and not be able to say no. When people came to me, when the casino business opened up on the Gulf Coast of Louisiana and somebody came to me from Las Vegas, a chef who said, Chef, we need help making a gumbo. We don't understand gumbo. And yet our clients on the Gulf Coast are saying, this isn't gumbo, can you help us? And I said, I, I, yeah, I can help you. I thought you wanted a recipe. And they said, well, can you make it for us? And I said, well, yeah, I guess I can make it for you. How much do you need? And they said, well, about 600 gallons a week. <laughs> I said, 600, I said, what? <laughs> I said, my God, 600 gallons a week. I had a, a five-gallon kettle. It's all I could make gumbo in in my <laughs> restaurant. I said, sure, I can do that. Because I knew from my trapper's cabin days that it wasn't about whether you could do it. It was how you had to do it. And that's, so, so uh, the manufacturing division grew out of a little five-gallon kettle and driving five gallons of gumbo at a time to the casinos. And today I produce over 100 million pounds of food every year that ships globally. I ship foods to Dubai, I ship foods to the Middle East, all over the Middle East, to South America, to Europe. Um, we do everything from sauce to soups to desserts to pastries to bakeries to, to vegetables. To, and chances are pretty good at any restaurant you'll stop in that's recognizable on the side of a highway or an interstate that's got a recognizable sign. Chances are pretty good you're eating some of my food in those places. If you stop at TGI Fridays and you eat their Jack Daniels glaze or you eat the, their Alfredo sauce, that's, that's Chef John Falls makes that. And, and on and on and on. I'm, I, I'm not privy to mention them all because sure. I, some of them are proprietary, but most of your big chain restaurants will have some of the things I do on their menu. Casinos from Vegas to the Gulf Coast to the... Uh, I, I do foods for their buffets. and uh, So, uh, yeah, about 100 million pounds of food a year in that division. We have a bakery division as well. Uh, we have a catering division, which caters all over the world as well. Uh, so if somebody wants to taste of Louisiana in Canada or Mexico City, we can do that too. We can bring them a taste of Louisiana, a Mardi Gras party, whatever they want. And, um, and then, of course, uh, uh, the restaurant scene itself. And, and, and again, sharing it with, with other people in a philanthropic way as well. We do a lot of things just as we do with, our, with PBS. It's so important to really tell the message of your area, of your, your cuisine, of the uniqueness of, uh, of what you're doing. And PBS, of course, is one of my most important vehicles to do that. And that's how people find out about us. They watch our shows, they like what we do, and they say, boy, look at that cooking set he's on over there. Look at that beautiful <laughs> kitchen. We could use some of that. Yeah. And PBS has really built my brand, so I'm very happy about that, too. So that, so all of the things you talk about uh, are, uh, 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 are just all kind of stitched together in some way. It's all food, and it's all authentic, and it's all seasonal and regional to me. So... Uh, 
So that's, that's, that's how our companies come together. And you know what else it is that I picked up, and, and I've interviewed a lot of successful people, and this shines through, and it shines through with you as a passion. Yeah. Uh, well, you, you know, I, I, I think first and foremost, it's, uh, it's I, I say all the time, it's uh, uh, a vision is not an art. You know, I mean, a lot of people have vision, and I, and, and I, I, I dwell on this all the time. Execution is the art, you know, a, a vision, everybody has it, and people say, I wish I'd have done that, or I could have done that. Well, it's the execution of the vision that makes things happen. Execution comes about from passion. If you, you execute because you want to, you execute because there's a demand inside that's driving you to do it, and then you thrive on doing it better and wanting to do more of it. And absolutely, it's, uh, it's, it's passion that makes everything in life really, really happen. It doesn't matter whether the passion is about making money or the passion is about sharing or the passion is about telling a story or writing a book. Let, let me tell you something. I, I got kicked out of my, my history class for, uh, at Nickel State University for not being smart enough to know where Europe was, and now I've written eight history books. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, and I told that to my professor. I, 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 I received an honorary PhD at uh, Nickel State University this past graduation, <laughs> and uh, when I left the stage with my honorary doctorate, uh, I call, the first person I called was my retired history teacher at Nichols who failed me in my class for <laughs> world history. I called him and I said, Dr. Barnage, I just have to tell you, I, I want to thank you for putting inside of me somewhere the passion to study history, even though I didn't know it at the time. I said, but you're the first person I called today to say thanks. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? Well, he wrote a big story recently about having John Falls call him after receiving a doctorate. After he said, can you imagine calling the professor that failed you to thank you? I said, he built in me a passion to succeed. I said, without failure, I would not have known how to succeed. Yeah, I said, I, and, and I came back to remind him that it was the failure in his class that got me somewhere, planted a seed. He planted that seed in history. And uh, today, after writing so many books on the subject, I'm happy to say, can you imagine writing the Encyclopedia of Cajun Creole Cuisine and, and having it so successfully? <laughs> I, 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 I attribute that to him in <laughs> some kind of way or other. So, anyway, great. yeah, passion, you're exactly right. That's great. <laughs> it has been a real pleasure to visit with you. <laughs> well, Jeff, it's been great to, see, great to see you, too. And thanks so much to PBS for all y'all do for me and all of the wonderful viewers out there who tune in every week. I mean, they're the ones who really make it happen for us. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's a great audience, great audience with PBS. We'll continue to look for you on PBS. You're also on the radio, and I have to mention this real quick, like, because you have a new book. It's called Hooks, Lies, and Alibis, The History of Fishing. I wish we'd <laughs> had more time to get to it maybe next time well, that's, around. That's my new PBS show, so y'all <laughs> let them tune in. <laughs> that sounds good. Chef John Fultz, thank you so very much for spending some time with us. By the way, you can see a lot more of our conversations online at WSRE.org slash conversations. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take good care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you.